Welcome back. In our previous lecture, we talked about some of the guiding philosophies behind how the scientific method is applied, but we hadn't quite reached a point where we could differentiate quantitative and qualitative research from each other. In our positivist hierarchy, we can see that what we generally think of as quantitative research, like experimental and statistical methods, provide a higher class of evidence than what we typically think of as qualitative research, which is comparative analysis or case studies. But as you might expect, things aren't quite so simple as just being able to say, quantitative research provides a higher quality of data than qualitative research. And you know, there's actually been a lot of contention throughout the past over that very idea. To put it simply, every field that conducts research has a certain historical bias towards qualitative or quantitative methods, and those biases carry over into the modern era in terms of how both styles are taught. Now, me personally, the way I think about it is that qualitative and quantitative research are kind of like long lost twins separated at birth that have recently found each other and begun to have a more familial relationship. That's right, it's the parent trap. Quantitative relation, uh, research was raised in a household of very analytical people who like to measure things and conduct statistical analyses. And quant tends to think about the world in very mathematical terms with an eye on predicting behaviors of groups of people. Now, qualitative research, on the other hand, was raised in a household of very emotional people who encouraged participation in the fine arts and who liked to talk out their feelings. Qual tends to think about the world of extremely individual experiential terms with an ear for hearing subtle variation in what people express about their lives. Quantitative research is ultimately derived from the field of statistics. And to truly understand the guiding philosophy behind a quantitative centric approach, you really need to think like a statistician. One of the fields of statistics that contributed greatly to quantitative methods uh, is economics, but also other hard sciences like geography and demography have all adopted many ideas and standards from which their work can be judged. Many of these fields are also the birthplaces of advanced statistical analyses and analytics that are common components of a marketing researcher's toolkit today. Quantitative methods have been a tool for empirical research, but they've fallen in and out of fashion throughout the decades of the 20th and 21st century, largely due to their complexity. In the early 20th century, quantitative research was really popular because it was being used to apply tools derived from new mathematics and statistics to provide analysis of complex systems such as manufacturing, distribution, social trends, and finance. And in the business world, which was becoming quite numbers driven due to an increased emphasis on production and scale, quantitative methods were extremely useful for optimizing output and reducing costs. At the social level, surveys were also quite popular because they could accumulate a large amount of simple information in a fairly efficient manner. And media companies, particularly magazines, use surveys routinely to collect information from large readerships and to target their focus and their advertising more specifically. On the other side of social research were a series of what were often referred to as interpretive methods. And many scientists who were focused on quantitative methods felt interpretive research had too much of a normative flavor to it to be useful. In fact, many of the other words that are still used to describe interpretive research, like subjective or hermeneutic or introspective or directional or postmodern, are often used in a pejorative or negative manner to describe qualitative research today. But as the field of social science began to take root in the late 19th and early 20th century, there was a lot of dissatisfaction with the limitations of what quantitative research could provide. And one of the driving fields of human research, psychology, became much more interested in moving away from broad measurement of populations and into more personal clinical measurement. This meant incorporating more interpretive techniques, which yielded a far deeper set of data and context than quantitative research ever could. And since these techniques were already being used by and refined by fields such as history, anthropology, sociology, and literary criticism, they carried with them a certain amount of intuitive credibility. Qualitative research also appealed greatly to consumer packaged goods companies and advertising agencies because the data were fairly easy to collect and they were easy to understand and because the stories that they could provide were often insightful and memorable. The researchers of the era were not actually called marketing researchers, but rather motivation researchers, and they tended to be formal social scientists 
who had contentious philosophies and preferred schools of thought, rather than, like today, marketers with training in formal research methods. Qualitative research was focused on in-depth interviewing, projective techniques throughout the 30s, 40s, and 50s, but the 1960s and 1970s popularized a new, more efficient method of qualitative research called the focus group. The focus groups became extremely popular for their ease of observation and scheduling. They allowed the business community to see research being performed, and they resembled familiar meetings where a consensus could be formed. In many ways, focus groups became qualitative marketing research because of their popularity and familiarity to the corporate world. And they're sometimes referred to today as the fast food of research methods. Even today, focus groups are fashionable, they're also problematic. And as we'll discuss later in this course, focus groups are an extremely contentious form of marketing research and they require a lot of rigor uh, to use properly for qualitative research. Now, quantitative research enjoyed a resurgence in the 1980s for marketing researchers as desktop computers and new software made for quantitative analysis became uh, much easier to conduct. While quantitative research had traditionally been done by hand or by conducting very simple analyses using mainframe computers or desktop PCs made it much easier to explore data sets, to build graphical representations of data, to conduct univariate and multivariate analyses, and to compare data from separate sets. Quantitative research also brought with it a certain amount of rigor and mechanical precision that fit in quite well in a corporate world obsessed with financial statistics and growth measures made more readily available by those same technologies. And since quantitative decision making was fast becoming a discipline in business school curriculum, qualitative research started to feel dated and less reliable as a result. By the mid 1990s, however, qualitative research swung back as researchers began to adapt their techniques to computerized approaches and focus groups in particular became a much more accepted and widely used element in many disciplines. This is also the time, by the way, that many focus group facilities started really sprouting up everywhere as marketing research firms all tried to get into the research facility business. The early 2000s swung back to a focus on quantitative research as digital technology allowed for a rise in online surveys and automated data collection tools such as CRM systems. Many research firms consolidated through mergers and acquisitions and qualitative research shifted to a focus on more experimental methods, including a number of new online techniques, many of which have since faded. And as big data has become a big problem for the corporate world, the pendulum is swinging back to place a greater emphasis on adding qualitative research into large studies as a valuable component of a body of research. There's also been a huge rise in what we call hybrid or qualquant or mixed mode research in which both qualitative and quantitative methods are being used in the same research design. Now in our final uh, lecture series, we're gonna talk about the future of qualitative research and what I envision it'll look like in 10 or 20 years. But for now, know this. Qualitative and quantitative methods are converging to some degree, and in the course of your careers, you're going to be required to be familiar with both because they're really two sides of the same coin. Both qual and quant research have since discovered each other, and after some initial conflict and in realizing how different they are on the surface, they've come to realize that deep down they're ultimately both methods of inquiry searching for truth. Their approaches are different, and the intent behind them and what they're hoping to uncover can greatly shape the perspective that they have to offer, but they're not so different deep down, and they can even appear to be the same thing when they're standing beside each other. But that word I just used, intent, is at the heart of what makes them very different. When I'm teaching marketing research basics, I often say that the word quantitative has an N in it, and that N stands for numbers. When you conduct quantitative research, it's because you want to be able to express your data in numerical, statistical fashion to describe a group of people. The word qualitative, though, has an L, and that L stands for listening. When you conduct qualitative research, it's because you want to listen to what individuals have to say and get a better understanding of their perspective. You'll express that information in terms of how commonly you've heard themes, but not with any kind of mathematical precision. And a few other differences you might note. When we're talking about qualitative data, we're often talking about being focused on individual responses as opposed to being focused on a sample or population level type of data. We're often looking at using primary research to achieve a depth of understanding rather than to generate descriptive statistics. 
qualitative is often less structured. Doesn't necessarily mean it's less rigorous, but it's often less structured and it's a little bit easier to pivot and change as you move along, whereas quant tends to be highly structured by necessity. And in qual, the results, results tend to be more interpretive, whereas in quant, they rely more on statistical analysis. And in theory, although not always in practice, um, your quantitative results should be a little bit more able to withstand the charge that they come from interpretation. Although again, uh, we, can, we can spend a little bit of time talking about that because there's more interpretation to quant than is often uh, thought. But whatever the case may be, those are the big differences between these two styles, and there is some overlap. But let's think a little bit about how you might use both of these types of approaches. Qual qualitative data tend to be more focused on direction than magnitude, and the intent of qualitative research is really about depth and understanding. One way to think about it would be the difference between how an accountant and an artist would see a jar filled with jelly beans. The accountant might be curious about how many jelly beans are inside, or how many different colors are represented, or what the ratio of colors to beans was. But the artist might be more interested in what the jar of jelly beans communicates and its form and its function, how the colors interact and how the interplay of light and shadow change the appearances of the beans. Both are seeing the same object, but thinking about it differently. The accountant is thinking about it quantitatively. The artist is thinking about it qualitatively. Now, one final note that skeptics of qualitative research often use is a tired old saying that tries to deflate it. And that saying is, the plural of anecdotal evidence is not data. In other words, if five people tell you the same anecdote, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. The problem is that five people telling you something does have meaning as a set of data. It just doesn't have the inherent credibility unless you investigate the source of the information and how they came to acquire it. Individuals speaking about their own experiences and perceptions are somewhat credible. Individuals speaking about something that they heard or think they know are less credible, and then they require some vetting and some validation. The problem is not with the data, but in the design and how those data were collected. And we're going to work hard in this class to avoid bad qualitative design that leads to hearsay. And instead, we're going to try to find good qualitative design that leads to really finding what individuals think and feel and combining that together into broader themes, taking us away from mere anecdotal evidence. With all that said, I'm now going to ask you a question that I'm sure you're going to find tremendously puzzling. How are qualitative and quantitative research like Batman and Superman? I'm going to give you that answer in the next lecture.